Yes, you mentioned 17 countries which are which have signed this MOU with the United States. India is not part of it, so which means that anything can be exported to the U.S. All sorts of antiquities, statues, yeah. idols, and it's accepted in the U.S. market. It is. Um, and our country has ratified, and the legal situation around this is more complicated than it should be. But um, basically, when you're bringing in ancient art right now, um, the only way customs can stop it is if they have a reason to suspect it's stolen. Just like they can't seize anything. You can't walk in with a, with a bag or anything, and they can't just take it. They have to have a reason to think it's stolen property. Um, which, which is difficult. That means they need a tip. They need to know which person is bringing in which item when. I mean, so just logistically, you can imagine how difficult that is. What these agreements do is they switch the burden of proof and they make these objects guilty, for lack of a better word, until proven innocent. So it gives our customs the authority, if there's an ancient artwork coming in, let's say from Cambodia, because we have an agreement from there. It gives them the authority to stop it and ask questions and demand proof that it was removed from Cambodia legally before letting it in. And so there's a real opportunity, I think. Again, there's 17 of these agreements. Um, there's a lot um, in Latin America. Several, as you saw from the map of the Latin American countries, have them. Um, Asia is starting to get a handful, Cambodia and China. Um, and then a few countries in Europe, but there's not one with India, and that's a big opportunity. And what prevents? What, what's the hurdle? I think one hurdle in the past has been just a lack of awareness of these agreements, um, and it is unfortunate. I, I wish they weren't required. In an ideal world, joining the 1970 UNESCO Convention, which is the main international law on this, should be enough. Um, the United States and Switzerland <laughs> require this extra step. A lot of other countries treat the 1970 UNESCO Convention as enough. Um, but our hope, is, um, our hope is that the Indian government, through the Ministry of External Affairs and the Cultural Ministry, um, will, will be interested in such an agreement. And we think there would be interest in, a lot of interest, actually, in the US government as well. Um, there's been an increased awareness in our State Department of how valuable these agreements are. Um, and um, I, th I think there would, I think it would find a lot of support. So hopefully, hopefully some people will take that up. And um, the film, I think, is going to do a lot to raise awareness of, of the need for such an agreement. And hopefully if we can couple that with an awareness of one possible solution to fight this that our two countries can work together on this because it's not a problem that any country acting by itself can defeat. It really requires international cooperation. Uh, ma'am, do you think there's a possibility, ma'am, that, ma that there's a tacit understanding uh, between uh, the vested interests uh, and, uh, within various governments of countries? Ma'am, ma that, uh, that uh, is uh, facilitating uh, such illicit trade. Oh, I think that's definitely been a problem throughout the past decades. Um, it took the United States some time to join this international agreement, the UNESCO Convention, because as you saw, there's a lot of money to be made in the art market. And the art market, it's an industry, it's a business, which means there are lobbyists, which means there are paid attorneys, which also means it's organized. Whereas there haven't been as many champions on the opposite side. Um, archaeologists were bad about not being terribly organized. There's not professional lobbyists, and it's taken some time. Um, I think, however, there is growing awareness and that things are changing um, and that we're seeing action, again, by the UN Security Council, by the FBI, um, by groups that don't have any interest one way or the other. They're not historical preservation groups. You know, they're, they're pretty neutral parties. They just want to stop crime. Um, that said, um, one does have to wonder, there are some holdouts, some countries that have not yet joined this convention. Um, and you have to wonder if it's because of the large art market there. Switzerland was very late to join, though they are a party now. Um, Thailand still has not joined. Um, and unfortunately, Thailand is frequently used as a laundering jurisdiction 
In fact, we're seeing reports that even pieces that are being looted from places like Iraq and Syria are being shipped to Thailand and then shipped to the United States to confuse law enforcement because then the import statistic, you know, it'll say Thailand, which is not raising a red flag. But I think for far too long, the market was able, the market's been able, the art market can be a pretty strong lobby. And it really surprises, it's the largest unregulated market in the world, not just talking about antiquities, but fine art as well. The largest unregulated market in the world. Um, you can, when we buy a car, I don't know what it's like in India, but when we buy a car in the United States, even if it's a very cheap car that is falling apart, you get a VIN number, an identification, you get an ownership history. You can literally spend hundreds of millions of dollars on an artwork at a major auction house and not know the name of the person who is selling it to you. You're supposed to trust that auction house to make sure that it's not you know, stolen property. You're supposed to trust the auction house that the person selling it is not doing this to launder money. Or, and we've seen this, I'm sure you've seen in the headlines lately, the um, growing US concern with sanctions against, let's say Russians and others. What's to stop a Russian billionaire from getting money into the United States by selling a major artwork? There's nothing right now. Um, and there's been no industry that's allowed to do that. Um, especially when you're talking about so many, you know, again, pieces, hundreds of millions of dollars. So I think, I think that's starting to change too, that people are just realizing that our, our political leaders are beginning to realize this isn't even just a matter of stolen property anymore, that it's money laundering risk, terrorist financing risk. And why should the art market have these rights that real estate and other markets don't have? But um, yeah, anytime there's a lot of money involved, it's hard to get things changed. So your interaction has been with the U.S. government a lot, right? Yes, we've worked um, closely with the U.S. government. And as I mentioned, Homeland Security has, it's not a big team, um, but I think it's a very dedicated team. And it shows what a few people have been able to do, but there certainly needs to do more. Um, it's unfortunate that I mentioned, so... Like India, we have a federal system, so we have the federal government and then state governments. And New York in particular has been very active. And it's no exaggeration to say there have been more cases bought, brought by one, just one attorney in New York State and Manhattan than the entire federal government. Um, so hopefully we'll see more, more prosecutions to follow some of the seizures and investigations because until people... As long as it's a slap on the wrist, the cost of do it's a cost of doing business. Um, if you only have to send the piece back, if you don't do jail time, what's to stop a multimillionaire or a company from just, oh, we'll, we'll lose a couple of pieces, but we'll keep selling. Um, but again, these pieces, the irony here is that unlike guns, unlike drugs, there's... It's hard to look at a piece and know whether it's legal or not. Um, it depends on the history. On the flip side of that, there's no legal source for these items. Even though we treat them as legal, there's no legal source. Where can you legally hack a bar relief off of a temple anywhere in the world? Um, and so for that reason, you know, like the person you quoted, uh, mm -hmm. why can it just not be stopped? Every item coming into the US is treated illegal. Hopefully, I, hopefully one day that will be the case because doing it on a country by country basis, as you can imagine, it's, it's challenging. Um, it's a lot of work and it's also just practically, uh, we're expecting customs agents to be able to look in an antiquity, know whether it's stolen or not, know whether it's real or not. That's from every country and every civilization in the world. Um, Europe is actually considering an EU-wide policy now that if you're bringing cultural objects in, and they've been changing what they count as cultural objects. I think the latest is 150 years old, something like that. Um, this hasn't happened yet, but they're looking at implementing a law just like that, that if you're bringing a cultural object of a certain age into the EU, you need to have an export permit. Um, and I think that'll happen eventually, 
Um, but it's it's a shame how long it is taking. And again, I think it's it's taking this long because there's been there's so much money in it. But my question is actually the other way around. Why can't everything coming into either Europe, China, US be treated illegal unless actually proved that it's recently made, yeah. which is 20, 30 years or made in a factory or something like that? And I think that's what's going to be needed. Um, I think that's what's going to be needed. And that's what Europe is working toward. Um, so we could see that in the EU for cultural objects within the next year or so. Um, but I think it, just realistically with the United States and our, our Congress is having some challenges, as you may have seen in the newspaper, uh, I think it'll be a, a while before the U.S. considers any additional legislation. But in the meantime, Options like this bilateral agreement could be a stopgap measure. Um, but I think it's going to really change. It's going to take, I think, increased awareness of, of that this is a problem. And I think that is happening. I mean, I've just noticed in conversations, even with you know, people on airplanes or whatnot, five years ago, nobody knew this was an issue. Um, and I think in part due to the media coverage that Daesh received, I think more people are realizing, oh, wait, we're where could, or even when you're looking at a museum collection, to start thinking about where these pieces came from. Um, because again, there's ironically no, or at least few, legal sources for archaeological objects. Um, but there's a multi-million, perhaps multi-billion dollar legal market, which makes no sense. Um, it's, in that sense, it's like the wildlife trade. And I think and I think there's awareness growing of that too, but it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a big problem and hopefully it's more and more countries, again, especially more and more of the market countries. Um, All tiger poaching in India happens because of consumption in China mm -hmm. for know, medicinal, supposedly medicinal mm -hmm. purposes. And so unless that demand stops, tigers are never going to be stopped. Yeah, and tigers have been here for years doing fine. The archeological ex sites existed for millennia. With no one stealing thing, I mean, from a lot of these temples, the ones in Cambodia were, um, there were very few pieces missing as late as the 1960s. And now if you go, I mean, I've, I've never been to a temple in Cambodia that hasn't been heavily looted. Um, and it's, it's happening in all sorts of objects too, like even uh, medieval churches in Europe have, have a huge problem. And they face the same challenge that, you know, you see here with tem temples in Tamil Nadu and places like that, that these are places of worship. They should be open to the local community. And how do you balance that with the increased need for security? Because um, it's difficult to have both. But, um, yes, sir. Yeah, um, I was wondering that uh, is wanting the cultural, historical artifacts uh, back linked to rise of nationalism in the country in some way? What are the factors that leads a country to make, you know, go for it? I think, that, I think there has been a correlation of that. Um, but also, and a lot of the work we do is with um, countries that have been in conflict um, or either are in conflict today. Um, I think certainly national identity um, is a, has been a big part, but I think also it's a big part of recovery too. Um, and what's been interesting to see in Cambodia is that after recovering, you know, these tens of millions of dollars worth of statues and fighting very hard to get them back, um, and I mean the government really did an amazing job with its campaign. Uh, something that I think helped a great deal was the support it had at the highest levels. Again, the Deputy Prime Minister made this a priority. Um, they had the Secretary of State doing negotiations with a lot of these museums. And so this one, who's, this is someone who's really trained in the art of negotiation, who knows how foreign legal systems work. Um, and they had a lot of success. And the interesting thing I found is that once they got these pieces back, they've been incredibly generous with uh, what they've loaned. Um, they've loaned pieces um, around the world. I mean, they want people to see Cambodian art because they're very proud of it. It's just like they should be benefiting from it too. And now that they've recovered and have gotten these pieces mm -hmm. back, they're in a position, they're in a position of strength to, to share them with the world. 
Um, and certainly we've been seeing, um, probably it's been in the headlines here too, that a number of West African countries are, are looking to Europe um, and wanting to know about their artworks that were clearly stolen um, during the colonial period and wanting to recover those. Um, but I think also it's just important to keep in mind pieces are still leaving. Um, and, and it's easier to stop the ones that are going now, and there's still a lot that's still disappearing from anywhere that has a history um, as a victim of this. And hopefully we'll see. I mean, what's unfortunate is that there's been the U.S., even though our laws are complicated, once a piece gets in, we do have some ability to recover it and send it back. Um, the U.K. has similar laws. Um, but in civil law countries, which is most of Europe, um, you can, um, a thief can transfer good title. And so if you're a good faith purchaser and you buy something in good faith, though again, I would argue, how can you buy something in good faith that's missing its feet? <laughs> like, of course that was stolen. Sure. But um, there's often no legal recourse to get something back. Um, so we've seen tribes like the Hopi, in America, the Navajo um, pieces that have been stolen have ended up in Europe. The U.S. government has tried to help these tribes recover them. They've had lawyers. They've done everything that they can possibly do and not been able to get them back. Um, hopefully, these laws that are coming into place will change that, too, because it's, it's, it's a very hard thing. Um, Strategically, uh, this level of business cannot survive without deep state. And uh, this good work of recovering and repatriation is just uh, uh, to look good for governments to do. You know, and uh, it is uh, going to be a war against the deep state and it cannot be a direct war. You know, and we are on the fringe, you know, we are on the, we are, we are not even, uh, we are nowhere, people. So, uh, without like uh, deep state getting attacked, which actually controls everything which uh, governments uh, are run by deep state. It is, it is a whole gamut of crime. It's conversions in our country. It's uh, like uh, whole issues are related to it. Human trafficking. So, uh, like uh, how, this is like to look good, you know, like I, I uh, do charity mm -hmm. just to look good, uh, to legitimize my criminal past. Mm -hmm. You know, no. so countries do it for just repatriation is the tip of the iceberg. What business they are doing? No, and the repatriations get a lot of press. Um, and I think they're important to raise awareness about, about the problem. But um, as you say, the, the real fight against the trade is the things that aren't making the headlines. Um, and that every illicit trade in the world, whether it's this or guns or drugs, there's usually some state corruption involved on both sides. Um, again, I think it's very strange that in the United States you have a market that is this big that's completely, largely unregulated. Nice. Now he had, I was talking to a Cambodian trafficker who had had a change of heart. He had, you know, been forced into this as a young man, did it for decades, and then um, has worked very hard since to, to help bring awareness of what happened because he regretted his role in it. And when you ask him, you know, what what caused the, this destruction and theft of the temples? He, he said money did this. Um, and it all comes down to someone wants something to put in their house and don't care how they, they get it. And governments, regardless of the government, when, when there's money, it's easy to, to do things. And um, again, we're seeing the people who are being tried now are, are the wealthy people in this trade, which I think just a few of those people going to jail, I think, is going to have a huge impact because that's been a big problem is that, okay, again, you, you get a slap on the wrist, what incentive is there to stop? Uh, yes. During the Subhash Kapoor raids, a uh, lot of idols were recovered in, from his warehouses, which were Indian in origin. Mm -hmm. So have they been returned to India or they are they still stuck in the U.S.? And a lot of them are still, some of them have been returned, a lot are still stuck because they have not been able to try him yet. 
And so um, once the trial happens, they'll be able to, under U.S. laws, legally return them. So right now they're in a warehouse somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the the unfortunate thing, too, is just with with the temples, again, usually, I mean, this has happened in Cambodia. There was a brief discussion about bringing these pieces back to the temple, and it was like, you know what, it's just too risky. So they ended up, I mean, in the National Museum, which, understandably, it's a lot easier to protect them there. But it is sad that they can't yet go back to, to where they're supposed to be. Um, they're building some reproductions now to have at the site, but um, it's it's a it's a sad thing that they can't be where they were for a thousand years. Artists, you did cover a lot on the Southeast Asia and America part. Do you have some experience like in the context of India? I mean, I, you mm-hmm. referred us to Vijay Kumar's book, but like if you can shed some light mm-hmm. on uh, yourself or your experiences with the Indian government or any. Uh, private party in India. We haven't we haven't done that much work yet. Um, mm-hmm. I, I just personally um, again I lived in Cambodia for years and so worked very closely with the um, in, so Indian the Cambodian the royal government of Cambodia. Our organization has mostly um, worked with Middle East and North African countries to date, um, and that's just um, because those are where the, the world's deadliest conflicts are at the moment and by extension, the worst cultural crises. Um, But now that we see through UN Security Council resolutions, um, through action in the US Congress, the US market to those pieces has largely been, obviously more can always be done, but legally at least the US market for pieces from Iraq, from Syria, from Egypt, for Libya has been closed off. Um, you have to, again, have evidence that the piece was legal to bring it in. Um, but with the exception of Cambodia and of China, um, even, you know, Afghanistan, Afghan antiquities, you can still bring in. Um, and so as an organization, we're starting to look at that more because our, our big focus is trying to close the U.S. market to illicit antiquities. Um, and there's still a lot that can be done um, from Afghanistan onward. Um, the market is still very wide open to that. And I suspect that, again, if you look, if you are in New York, you know, go into an antique shop and, again, it's how can any of these pieces have entered the market legally? Um, I mean, we're not talking, obviously, about Chinese furniture that was meant as a commercial item, but, you know, sacred objects, there's, there's no legal source for them. Um, and, yeah, there's a a huge legal market. Um, so there's a lot more that we can we can be doing, and which is why we were really grateful for the opportunity to be here to learn more about about what's taking place. Uh, ma'am, so a few months back, I asked uh, Vijay Kumar uh, mm-hmm. uh, about 200 artifacts that are supposed to come, but are stuck in the bureaucratic deadlock. And so he told me that uh, uh, I, and not just I, all of us mm-hmm. will be getting the, uh, good news very soon, but we are still awaiting that. Ma'am, such is the statute of affairs. Yeah, it's the the wheels of justice turn slowly, as they say. And um, as you may have seen, our government was shut down for a bit, um, which I don't think helped the matter much. But um, there is a huge backlog now of repatriations. But um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully we'll be getting some positive positive news soon. So. I encourage you to follow him on Twitter as well. It's Poetry in Stone. This is his handle, and he's amazingly active in reporting on this. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs>